When a man goes camping in the middle of the woods, he has a close encounter of the furred kind. And then we meet a woman who's having a real rough go at life. She's surrounded by alcoholism, despair, poverty. But just when she's thinking about committing the ultimate mistake, two aliens appear and offer her a second chance at life aboard their starship. Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Garbiner. I'm having a great day. I hope you guys are having a great day too. I hope you guys are having tons of fun out there in the world doing whatever you're doing. We got a ton of stuff to cover, so we're going to get started right away. First off, walking into Dead Rabbit Command, I got two more shout outs to give from the Oregon Ghost Conference. Walking in right now. Everyone get on your feet and give it up for Monique and Joss. Woohoo! Yeah, we are cartwheeling into Dead Rabbit Command. They have a little synchronized cartwheel thing. <laughs> I mean, basically, it's just, this, it's just one move, them cartwheeling, but it's impressive. Monique and Joss, you're going to be our captains, our pilots this episode. Monique and Joss are actually a husband and wife team. They're a host of a paranormal podcast called Fright Life Paranormal. I'll have links in the show notes. You can also search any podcast provider for the name Fright Life or Fright Life Paranormal and you'll find them. If you guys don't have your own paranormal podcast, if you guys can't support the show financially, both those things are totally good too. Just help spread the word about Dead Rabbit Radio. That helps out so much. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell everyone you know that Rabbit Radio is your favorite show. But maybe don't say that in front of Monique and Joss. They're like, what? Aw. Monique, I'm going to start off by tossing you the keys to the Jason Jalopy. We're going to leave behind Dead Rabbit Command. Everyone hop on side and drive us all the way out to Colorado. (laughs) We're headed back to the year 1998, and it's springtime. Flowers are in bloom. Apples are falling off trees into the greedy hands of squirrels. They're eating them up. Worms, probably, are coming out of the soil. We're about to meet this man. We don't have his real name, but we're going to call him Thomas. Thomas is hiking through Colorado. Probably, like, the mountainous region. I don't know if he's in Denver. He's uh, walking around the streets. He's actually just a hobo. He's hiking through the wilderness portions of Colorado. And he's camping. You know, when the sun goes down, he's like, ah, it's time to make camp. Puts on a pot of beans. Sits there, sits there listening to squirrels, ducks probably, walking by. Goes to sleep. The life of a camper. Well, at some point during his hiking trip, he is asleep in his tent. It's early morning, not so early where the sun hasn't come up. But, you know, you're camping. You don't really want to get up before like 7 or 8. It's freezing cold up in the mountains. So he's probably sleeping in. Would you even bring an alarm clock on a camping trip? Would you be like, ah, yes, 5.30, the butt crack of dawn. Time to start walking again. I I guess if you were fishing, you'd want to wake up early. But if you were just, like, out by yourself camping, who cares when you wake up? You're like, oh, no. Oh, no, I didn't get to walk more today. I'll just walk a little less and camp again. You're probably sleeping in. But anyways, whether or not he had an alarm clock, he's woken up. By the sound of something smashing its way through the forest. He's hearing something moving through the branches and it's moving fast. Thomas is both an experienced hiker and an inexperienced hiker. Which probably just make him an amateur hiker. More experienced than me. But less experienced than probably a lot of you. Because he wakes up. He's like, what, huh? What's that noise? It sounds like something smashing through the forest. If I heard something smashing through the forest, I'd have no idea what it could be. I wouldn't be able to differentiate between the sound of a black bear running through the forest or an elk running through the forest. I would just hear a bunch of stuff. I would just be peeing my pants, or I'd just hear something coming through the forest. He wakes up and he goes, oh my god, that's the sound of a mad bear. <laughs> Not a sound of a sad bear. Like a rampaging bear is coming through the forest. I recognize the sound of those breaking twigs. Anywhere. It's the sound of a crazy bear, and it's headed my way. It's headed right towards my campsite. He's an experienced hiker, camper in that aspect, but he has no form of self-protection. 
at all. <laughs> he didn't bring his condoms. He's like, oh no, I saw that movie, The Revenant. Leonardo DiCaprio got uh, raped by that bear, and I did not bring condoms to this camping trip. No, he didn't have like a gun. He didn't have a gun, or I would figure like if a bear's charging towards your campsite, you should have a shotgun or a revolver, <laughs> preferably a bazooka, right? Preferably some sort of rocket launcher. But, you know, you can't have any of those. You left your anti-aircraft gun at home. I've heard that revolvers are better against bears than shotguns because the shot... <laughs> Wait, is the opposite? Now that I'm thinking about it, I'm like, uh, I'm packing for my camping trip. I'm like, I don't remember which one. I've heard that revol... I think revolvers are better against bears than shotguns because unless you're using, like, the big balls that shoot out of a shotgun, you're like, bullets, Jason? Are you talking about bullets? No, they have buckshot, and then they have the... They have... Well, anyways... <laughs> I'm already, I'm already getting a ton of emails, even as I'm recording this, people explaining my ignorance about uh, firearms. I've heard a revolver is better than a shotgun. He doesn't have anything. He doesn't have, like, a Molotov in his tent, which is probably a good idea as well, right? He doesn't even have a machete. Like, a machete's not going to do much damage against a bear, but at least after it eats you and hopefully animal control finds the bear and avenges your death, they'll be like, well, Thomas sure got ate by this bear. We found all of him in its stomach. But look at that cool scar he gave that bear. The coroners are giving the hold up your hand and give it a high five. They're like, dude, you really like got a good swipe on this bear. So, so there's that. Right? That'd be better than nothing than swinging around machete. All he has is a hiking stick. And he goes, this bear's coming at me, and I'm just going to poke it. I'm going to poke it away with my stick, and then maybe it'll go away. Well, he hears it rampaging through the woods, and all of a sudden, he doesn't hear it stop, but he hears it change directions. It's like running right towards his campsite, and then he hears it kind of veer off. So it's no longer making a beeline for his tent. And now he hears it running around the campsite like he's trying to avoid it and at that point thomas unzips his tent sticks his head out and what he sees is no bear well technically it could have been technically it could have been what he sees because it's kind of a fleeting glimpse he gets some details he said it was a huge dark hairy shape Running through the trees. You're <laughs> chasing like a bear? That's how most people would describe a bear. Sure. But this huge, dark, hairy shape running through the trees also seemed to be carrying something in its arms that was red. Carrying something that he can tell is red. And he, he goes, I was too terrified to really do anything else but to watch. He goes, I watched it come around the perimeter of my tent, and then it hit this hill. There's like this hill hill nearby. And he goes, it ran up it so fast, and it still was making so much noise, it was basically just pushing anything out of the way that he came across. He compared it to the sound of a tank going up a hill 60 miles an hour, which is a pretty specific sound. Right? I don't think that's a sound that most of us have ever heard. But he apparently he has, because he's like, ah, oh, memories. Oh, those days I was in the trench in 1914. He said it sounded like a tank going up a hill at six miles an hour, just tearing butt through the woods. Everything's just getting knocked down. And he's in his tent. The, it's gone. It's ran off. And he's like, okay, on the one hand... It's a beautiful it's a beautiful spring morning. I have all this camping planned. So I'm just going to pack up and continue my journey. On the other hand, Thomas felt like he had seen something that he wasn't supposed to see. In his gut, there were supposed to be no witnesses to this. It was just this weird kind of thing. So again, he's thinking it's not a bear. Something, it was some sort of, something was out there in the woods. He was carrying this red thing. You know, maybe it was a deer carcass that it had killed or something like that. Maybe it was blood. I'm going to get out of here. So following his gut instinct, Thomas packed up his campsite and hiked back 
hiked out of the area, got in his car, and left. But the more Thomas thought about this, he started to think, I don't think it was carrying like a dead deer. And it's funny because you can kind you can kind of see the logic in his head as he probably lied to himself about this for a while, right? The story's quite old, close to twenty years old, right? He's probably kind of tried to convince himself otherwise, but he goes, looking back on it, I think what that creature was carrying was a red cloth. And if I think about it a little more, I think it was not just any old red cloth. It was a red t-shirt. And if I really want to dwell on it, and I don't, but if I really want to think about what it was, if I had to be honest, he may have been carrying a child who was wearing a red shirt. It's interesting because you could see that progression. You see something horrific and your brain just goes, oh, like you just catch a glimpse. But really your brain's processing all that information and you don't want to think about it while you're out in the woods. Because if you were able to go, that was weird. I just saw this monster, (laughs) just saw a monster from beyond imagination run by my campsite. That's weird in and of itself. Carrying something red, I'm out of there. And then as you kind of got away from the situation, thought about it, you would realize, I saw him carrying a child. Like, my brain didn't want to process it at the time. Because if you were at that campsite, even if you just had a hiking stick, and you saw something run by carrying a child, I think you would try to at least follow it. Like, you would kind of have an obligation to at that point. You could say, well, I'll go back to town and call the police. But, you know, the kid could be all eaten up by then. So, yeah, I think if you thought about it, if you saw that happen, you'd be like, well, I better go follow. Follow that monster. <laughs> follow that monster up. This is how my life ends. I'm about to die. But yeah, I, I think if you thought it, you would have to. I, I, I mean, this is 1998, so no one had cell phones. Even if you did have a cell phone, it probably wouldn't have worked out there. So what do you do in that situation? And he goes, you know, I think about, you hear a lot about, people going missing in the woods and stuff like that, and maybe something like this is taking them. He doesn't specifically ever use the word Bigfoot in his account. This was, I found this on thingaboutadocs.com. They got it from a Facebook group called Cali Entities Group, like California Entities Group, which is no longer around. I looked for the Facebook uh, group. I couldn't find it. But he never specifically uses the term Bigfoot, but I think that if evidence points in that area... As far as like, you know, there's a lot of big, hairy things running around the United States in the woods. <laughs> I had to add, add that last part in there. He doesn't specifically use the word Bigfoot, but I, that's probably what this was. And it probably did kidnap a kid. From where? Why? I mean, who knows? Use your imagination. <laughs> maybe maybe not too much. Maybe not too much, you sicko. But yeah, he probably, this Bigfoot probably did capture this kid. Maybe he's going to eat it. <laughs> I guess that's the only option, right? What, what, he's going to raise him as his own. He's like, me, kid, die. Me, Bigfoot, sad. You knew Bigfoot. <laughs> he's all taking the fur off his dead kid and stapling it to this new boy. He's like, no, I don't want to be a Bigfoot. I wanted to be a fireman when I grew up. Um, No, he probably, he probably snapped this kid in two and ate him. But who knows? It's a creepy story. It's also possible that it was just a bear carrying like... Well, actually, that's creepy too. If you saw a bear running by and you saw some red cloth on him, you assume, oh, he just ate. He just ate somebody. He's not stealing someone to eat him later. He just ate someone and he used the guy's shirt as a bib. But it's a creepy story and most likely one that wasn't reported for a long time. I don't think he went into town and was like, guys, guys, you won't believe what I just saw. (laughs) <laughs> he goes, I don't even know what I saw. I don't even know what to put it in words. But it, I think it kidnapped a kid, and then all the townspeople go there with their shotguns or revolvers hunting this thing. He probably just went home and didn't tell anyone because it was so insane. And then 
as months and possibly years passed, he finally began to share the story, and then it ended up on a Facebook group. A creepy story. You have to figure that a lot of these cryptids are violent, especially Bigfoot. I know a lot of times he gets a lot of love, and I, sure, he's a cool dude and all, but I'm sure he sucks his fair share of bone marrow out of freshly killed human femurs. Because why else would he have the strength and the ferocity? And, and to be honest, the teeth of a gorilla, if he wasn't cracking open heads with his bare hands and eating brains. Like, you can't have it both ways. You can't have the musculature and the teeth and the abilities of a gorilla and eat berries. Or <laughs> Wait, I think some gorillas eat berries. <laughs> or maybe they all do. I know more about gorillas than I know about guns, which isn't a lot. But, you know, they got, like, those teeth for eating meat. I think they're omnivores. I think gorillas... <laughs> I don't know nothing about gorillas. I'm like, I unequivocally state... I can't even pronounce that word, but I state it anyways. Gorillas do this. Um, but I assume that gorillas squish people's heads and eat them from time to time. If Bigfoot's eight feet tall, he'd have to eat a lot to, to maintain that. Unless he's from another dimension. Which I don't know what the dietary requirements are for interdimensional entities, but if it is a biological creature, he has to eat a lot. We have stories of them eating deer, and what is a human but an antlerous deer? Monique and Joss, I'm going to go ahead and toss you guys both flight suits. Suit up and call in that carpenter copter. We are leaving behind the Colorado wilderness. Take us all the way out, too. Ukraine. We're headed to Kiev. Kiev? Kiev. One of the two. I know there's different pronunciations. The year is also 1998. I actually didn't plan it to be this way. I just picked two stories that I thought were really cool, but they took place in the same year, possibly even the same day. These events could be happening at the same time. We don't have a... The last story we knew took place during the spring. This one is just any time in the year 1998. We do know that it takes place late at night. And we do have the real name of the person who this story happened to. Her name is Alla. A-L-L-A. Alla. And she's sitting at home. And she is thinking, my life sucks. It can't get any worse. Now, a lot of people probably say that. A lot of people are probably saying that in Kiev, in Ukraine right now. But in 1998, Ala was thinking, my life cannot get any worse. Let me list the ways that my life is terrible. My husband is an alcoholic. That's, that's a huge one right there. That must be so hard to be in a relationship with someone who's suffering from alcoholism. But she's not only a wife of an alcoholic, she's a mother. And all of her children are also alcoholics. So, <laughs> either I don't know if her children are all adults, or if it's a bunch of 12-year-olds running around drunk. Both are, <laughs> both are definitely possible. Both are definitely possible in this situation. She's bringing groceries home and she's like has some eggs and some milk and then a bunch of alcohol. And the kids are like, all right, mom, you brought us some, <laughs> you brought us some vodka. Yay, glug, glug, glug. And she's like, no, that's, that's for your school lunches, guys. They're like running around all drunk. It's definitely, <laughs> it's definitely possible that these kids were loused all day long and her husband and all is just like, Life sucks. Like, <laughs> literally, how can it get any worse? The only thing that could be worse right now is if I was pregnant. <laughs> that baby was drunk. That baby was making me drink. And it comes out all loopy. Whoa. Walks to the nearest bar. My life sucks. And it's just miserable. So, I'm going to kill myself. Allah says. I am done with this. I can't deal with it anymore. I'm going to kill myself. She goes, my life's never going to get any better. So what's the point of going on? And I'm sure she had thought about this. I'm sure she had thought about this before. 
I'm sure it had been like kind of in the back of her head a couple times when she's like watching her whole family get drunk around her and she's like, I should kill myself. And then she probably just kind of forgot about it. She has a to-do list and she's like, oh, what was I supposed to do? I forgot to write it down. She probably thought about it a couple times, but this time she was dead set on it. I'm going to kill myself tonight. I'm going to do it. And then all of a sudden, she hears a knock at the front door. What? What was that? It's late at night. You don't expect people to be knocking on your door. You assume it's the police. You assume it's the police. They found one of your children, got in a bar fight, smashed a baby bottle over some dude's head. But before she can answer the door, two humanoids just appear in her living room. Just appear out of thin air. Teleport, most likely, right? She said, she uses the term humanoids. She doesn't specify much about their appearance, which generally means they look human. If they were gray aliens, you would go, yeah, they're humanoids. They were also four feet tall, gray, giant eyes. In this report, they keep describing them as humanoids. However, they did have one peculiar feature. Their hands were black claws. With long nails. Check, 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 check. So I don't know if that's like a lobster claw with nails sticking out of it. Or like a wolverine claw. But anyways, these were human. <laughs> I glossed over that part because I can't comprehend it. I was like, what? It was described as black claw-like hands with long nails. I, those two things don't really work in my head. But anyways, everything else looked human. And these two humanoids appear in her living room. And they tell her, this is an exact quote. From one of these aliens. They say. Don't do what you are planning. It's better. That you come with us. So we have teleportation. We have telepathy. Or possibly seeing the future. They knew she was going to try to kill herself. And they intervened. Guardian angels. From deep within the galaxy. Don't kill yourself. Your life does suck. (laughs) We agree. We agree we've been monitoring your planet for a millennia and you in particular for the past 30 years. We know that your life does suck, but don't kill yourself. You can come with us. Now, obviously, this is a bit of a shock to her. She didn't she didn't expect visitors, let alone people who can teleport into her house. And she begins to question them. Who are you guys? Where are you from? Like, what's going on? And they kind of drop a bunch of exposition right at the beginning. They say... We're from another planet. We are aliens. We're actually shapeshifters. This, the form you're seeing is not our true form. We thought these black claws would be more pleasing to your human eyes. They go, we're shapeshifters. Uh, we can change our shape. It's kind of implied. We can also increase and decrease our mass at will. But that's left our species with a couple of disadvantages. Sure, we can shapeshift into an elephant... Or the size of a human. But we're really bad at physical labor. <laughs> have, you ever tried, have you ever tried doing heavy lifting with these claws? Even if we're an elephant, we just have giant claws for feet. They go, we're really bad at physical labor. Like, that's something that our species just can't do. And we like to take humans... And have they help us out with physical? <laughs> they help us out with physical tasks. Now on Earth, we would call them slaves or employees, right? But in, you're not getting paid in space bucks. You're on you're on a spaceship somewhere, floating through the vast cosmos. Um, I'm pretty sure, at the very least, let's split it down the middle and say you're an indentured servant. We need humans for physical tasks, but you, Allah, you are a woman. And we have a very special task for human women. You see, we can't reproduce. Our species is having problems carrying our young. (laughs) With these hands, we keep dropping them. We've lost a lot of babies last year. Uh, The female of our species, they can't carry our children to term. So we borrow human women to become part of our breeding program. And 
This is not a joke. This is no joke. As they are telling her this, she she's putting her shoes on. She's getting ready to put her shoes on. She's like, okay, wait. You had me at aliens. You guys had me the second you beamed in. She actually, like, as they're talking, she gets up to put her shoes on. And one of the aliens goes, there's another weird quote. Uh, he says, no footwear is needed. And the next thing she knows, she's standing in this huge room. So she was ready to go. And again, I think there is some telepathy here. They do. She does say that they speak Ukrainian. But when they talk to each other, it's a very sing-songy voice. However, I think there is some telepathy there because, like, she was just ready. <laughs> she, she, she was ready to leave. She was looking for her shoes, and they said, no, you don't need any shoes. Next thing she knows, she's in this large room. And she said there's three big compartments kind of laid out. Like, she's standing in this room, and then she can see these three compartments. One of them is full of around 20 men, 20 human men of various ages. Which I would assume would be, you know, like late teens to maybe 40s or 50s. Could have been a couple of babies in there. Could have been an elderly man in there as well. But she said 20 men of various ages, 20 human men of various ages. The second compartment was empty. And in the third compartment, she sees two human women in that compartment. But what kind of catches her eye? I mean, other than the fact that she is what we can only assume is some sort of alien vessel. What catches her eye is that the two women in the third compartment, she describes them as elderly. And one of them, she overhears one of them say to the other woman, she goes, this is again a quote, she goes, quote, I can't understand. Whether I am still in this world or are already dead and in heaven. So Allah overhears this conversation between these two women. And and Allah, the reason why she's kind of surprised by this is because from what they told her, human men are taken by these aliens to work, to do physical labor. But human women are there for the breeding program. But both of these women are far past their child-rearing days. And when all is processing that, all of a sudden, more of these alien humanoids appear with the claw hands, and they are walking into this large room where all is at with another young woman, a Russian woman. And now she realizes that the aliens can both speak fluent Russian and fluent Ukrainian, as well as that sing-songy voice they used to talk to each other. The woman, this other young woman, walks in and she's like, Hey, how, how's it going? Hey, how's it going? When she sees Allah and Allah's like, uh, Good, good, I guess uh, we're both aboard an alien starship. What's interesting is that when the young woman walks in, and when I say young, you know, we're probably like mid to late 20s, she walks in, Allah hears one of the male, the men are in their compartment, right? They're, let, let's be straight. They're, they're prisoners. They're prisoners. They can't leave this compartment. But she overhears one of the men go, uh, here is one more prisoner. When he sees this woman walk on board. And I think Allah's kind of putting these pieces together. If women are brought up for the breeding program, but yet there's two women who are elderly and possibly have dementia, one of them's like, where am I? Am I dead? Is this heaven? Where's Charles? It's his turn to cook. It's most likely they're not going to let these people go. She overhears one of the men call the new woman a prisoner. These women have grown old in their captivity. But... This is far better than being at home. All is still thinking, this is better than what I have at home. Far better. <laughs> There's no, are there any alcoholics here? Aliens are like, what's alcohol? She's like, oh my God, please let me stay. This young woman walks up to Ola and they start chatting, as you do, aboard an alien vessel. 
And the young woman says, I was at a dance hall. And I had just left. And all of a sudden, these humanoids, she points to the guys with the messed up hands, with the clients. She goes, they appeared outside the club. And they asked, do you want to have sex with us? Like, they were far more upfront with this lady than they were with Allah. She goes, I walked out of the club and they asked if I wanted to have sex with them. And at first I was kind of shocked by the proposition. But then I realized I hate my husband's guts. And I don't want to go back home. So I said, sure, I will have sex with you. And the next thing you know, I'm walking aboard this spaceship. They didn't give her any any of this backstory. They're like, many, many years ago, when our species ruled the galaxy, we are... We started shape-shifting, and now we can't have kids. They're just like, hey, you want to bang? She's like, yeah, sure. Being married sucks. So they're both aboard this space vessel. What comes next is an interesting part of the puzzle. I mean, obviously, if we're hearing this story from Allah's point of view, we know she gets off the ship somehow. But the way she gets off the ship, Allah said what happened after she was talking to this young woman. We'll call the young woman Samantha. We'll just give her name. Allah and Samantha are aboard the ship. And the aliens go, okay, first off, we have to do some medical examinations on you. Which would make sense if you were going to use someone in your breeding program. You'd want to make sure they're in tip-top shape. Look under the hood, as it may be. So they take these women and they begin doing these medical examinations on them. And the aliens are, like, taking notes and <laughs> stuff like that. They're writing down with their claw hands. They're dropping pins. They're like... Can you get one of those can you get one of those humans out to pick this pin up, please? Thank you. They're taking all these notes, they're running all these physical tests on the women, and the aliens are kind of looking at each other. Mm-hmm, yeah, yeah. Sing songy voice. Then Allah said they gave us a mental test. Where she goes, part of it was we had to memorize chemical compositions. So they see like a CO2 and then like an H2O and then like a Q and they'd be like, "Mm." (laughs) oh, yeah, you know, that's uh, that's that chemical. And the aliens are like, very impressive. What about these? And they're like, "Um, that's uh, something, something. I don't know if you took quartz and put it in oil. Aliens are like impressive, impressive. They know all these chemicals. (laughs) All two of them. The aliens like, that's all the technology we have. Allah and this young woman are doing this battery of tests to basically prove that they are worthy of joining the alien's breeding program. This is heartbreaking. (laughs) This is such a heartbreaking story. At the ending of it, the aliens go, Samantha, welcome aboard to the shape-shifting breeding program. We're sure you'll have lots of fun up here. Allah... Um, you unfortunately did not pass any of our tests. Actually, I don't think they told her that she failed all of it, but she failed some of it. She's like, and you passed the physical? They're like, yeah, you're going to die in about three months. They all said that they ran this battery of tests on them, and Samantha, they're like, Samantha, welcome aboard. And then they just told me, um, we'll take you back home. And Allah just kind of stood there as the aliens started working these controls on this ship. And the next thing Allah knew, she was back in her living room. Back on Earth. Not a single problem of her life had been solved. Everything was exactly the same. But now, not only was she surrounded by a family of alcoholics, not only. Was her life just one garbage fire after another? Now she knew that there was a better life out there. A future among the stars. Seeing things that most humans couldn't even dream of. But that life had rejected her. One more failure. One more tragedy. In Allah's 
already miserable life. This story I also got on Think About It Docs.com. I didn't plan on doing these two stories back to back again. They got it from Leonid uh, Tarantiev. We've actually covered, I believe we covered some of his stuff before. He's a noted UFO author. This was in an article called UFO Captives in a magazine, a periodical called Secret Doctrine Number 7. It's interesting because we have that story. We have the person's name, Alla. The person telling the story to Leonid is someone known as Tatiana Nuralieva. So I don't know if that was Alla's friend or a member, non alcoholic member of Alla's family. What happened to Alla? Why isn't she telling the story? Obviously, she cannot be telling the story because she doesn't know who to contact. It's possible she's not telling the story because she doesn't want the infamy that can come from reporting UFO events. It's also possible she's not telling the story because she's not alive anymore. Which is it's such a, 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 a kind of heartbreaking UFO story. I mean, it's possible she... And her entire family, they never said she was an alcoholic, but it's possible that everything turned out nice and spicy for Alla and her family all went to a 12-step program and (laughs) her kids eventually graduated high school and everything was okay. That's definitely possible, but it's also possible. Matt, you know, this story is so interesting because, yeah, it's it's pretty sad and it's kind of heartbreaking, but you would imagine that... It's probably true in the sense that if you were running an alien breeding program, you'd probably have some pretty strict requirements. You probably would want... Because, I mean, even now, like on Earth, if you want to be a sperm donor, you at least got to... I think you have to take an IQ test or some sort of test, right? I mean, I hope, right? They're just not, like, letting hobos walk in. Like, I need $5. They're like, jack off into this cup. They're like... They already bring out a Starbucks cup. They're like, uh, here you go. Three days worth. I'm pretty sure there's some requirements just on Earth. If you were going to do it in space, you would want to make sure that they meet the requirements. But to take somebody who's already... Because remember, the aliens showed up. They knew she was going to try to kill herself. They're like, don't. Don't do it. You'll have much more fun with us. As they look side to side, they're like, uh, she can pass the test, right? It's like, what was the the point of all this? They knew she was going to kill herself. They could have, at the very least... Well, here's the thing, too. I was going to say they could, at the very least, keep her up there. But there's there's two sad elements about this. One is the idea that this woman whose life was just trash was invited up to hang out with a bunch of aliens, and then they rejected her because she failed some tests. She doesn't know if it was the physical or the mental or what, but she didn't pass. They kept Samantha... They sent her back to her miserable life, knowing full well the aliens knew that her life sucked. And they sent her back anyways. So you could, that's sad in and of itself. But then it's also sad because what, these were human prisoners on this ship. The men out and out said it. Here's another prisoner when they watch Samantha walk in. Those men were hanging out in this compartment. She kept using the word compartment, but, you know, was it a... I, I'm assuming she could see into it, maybe like a, a some sort of barrier, translucent barrier, but she sees 20 men in one room. The second room's empty. What's that room for? Like, who or what is going to end up in there? And then the third compartment has the two elderly women who... I mean, you know, I don't think they were like, I don't think they were like my grandma McGee. I don't think they were 93 years old hobbling around in there watching Mama's family. But they were definitely, you know, even if they're 60, 70 years old, they're past their ability to give birth. And the aliens still won't let them go. Which, you know, it's, it takes you down an even darker road. It's possible that these women are they're going to be prisoners forever and again like one of them's totally lost the concept of reality she doesn't even know where she's at so it could be that they just don't want to let them go but it's also possible like sure a human woman can't give birth after the age of say 55 
after menopause. Let's just say 55. But if you had alien technology, you could probably have a woman who was 108 pumping out babies, like three an hour. Because why not? You're aliens, right? You just push a bunch of eggs down her throat. And they just all, like, come screaming out of her. So it's possible that they were making these old women have babies. There's no evidence to back that up. You're like, gross. Jeez. That's disgusting. Where did you get this pumping eggs down their throat? I figured they had some sort of alien lovemaking ritual. I didn't know they were like that old Porky Pig cartoon where he was force-fed donuts. Um, 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 but they were eggs. Uh, who knows? <laughs> There's no evidence to back that up. You're welcome for those new nightmares I've given you. But they're definitely prisoners. They're definitely not able to go home. They've been kept there. They probably joined this alien program 30, 40 years ago, maybe. And they're still on board this ship. For what purposes? We don't know. I just picked the grossest one. And Samantha stayed aboard the ship. Samantha stayed aboard the ship to become part of the breeding program. And you could say, even with hearing people talk about being a prisoner and even with seeing these elderly women who had never been let home, why would you willingly be taken by an alien race to really be, I mean, at the best, a artificial egg inseminator, right? You're, they're just pumping you full of little baby baby cells and then you're giving birth. And at, that's at the best, and at the worst, an alien sex slave. And it's weird, because you go, yeah, I mean, like, those are both terrible options. <laughs> well, the worst would be an elderly, elderly alien sex slave. But it's crazy to think that all his life was so bad... That even piecing all of these together, both thinking, wow, these women must have been on board the ship for decades. These men are referring to us as prisoners. She still wanted to live aboard that ship. The unknown future with the alien shapeshifters was better for her than the knowable future on Earth. She wanted to be on that ship. She wanted to take her chances at being a slave than to return to Earth. But in the end, she wasn't good enough. Imagine if that, imagine that thought going through your head. I was not good enough to be an alien sex slave or possibly even an alien sex goddess right they may worship them but probably not they do have elderly women in a cage <laughs> i'm trying to put a good spin on it but imagine if your your life sucks so badly you'd rather be an alien sex slave than live another day on earth with your family and even the aliens rejected her even the aliens broke her heart honestly after all of this i probably would be too scared to kill myself i'd be terrified to die because what would be going through my head is life on earth is terrible and then as a second chance i was offered a new life in deep space. And that rejected me as well. How can I think for even a moment that the afterlife will give me any peace? Either. Is all existence, even non-existence, suffering? If there's no hope for me on earth... And there's no hope for me among the stars. Maybe there's just no hope. Hey 
DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be our email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash DeadRabbitRadio. TikTok is at DeadRabbitRadio. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great one, guys.